This homily includes as its basis some of today's readings, but it also widens out to the last several weeks of life here at Willow Avenue. This past week, we co-hosted Creation Speaks, the title of this year's Kids Camp, with our friends at Mennonite Community Church. And in worship commission, several weeks ago, as we sketched out our summer worship series, we marveled at the timing of it all. Because last Sunday, the theme was garden. What better place to begin talk about creation for the week of Creation Speaks than in the garden? We made sundials on the first day when the theme was light. We made succulent fairy gardens. Thank you for all of your clippings and donations. And we talked about God creating water and plants. We played animal charades and made self-portraits for the most gorgeous art project that is on display in the fellowship hall. And the last day we talked about rest and the need to care for our bodies. Just like God wants us to care for the planet and for one another, God wants us to care for ourselves too, because we are part of God's creation. And God wants us all to flourish. So we know that the garden was the perfect place to start last week, but I hadn't really realized that today, the theme of peace would close kids camp so well. I just assumed this was the work of the Holy Spirit. Our creation activity for the last day was talking about caring for ourselves by dealing with big emotions. Emotions like anger, worry, sadness, overexcitement, jealousy, shame, joy, and peace. We did different activities with our breath and our bodies to help us move through these big emotions. Did they actually work, you wonder? Let's see exhibit A. Some of them are ready for a nap after this exercise. You can ask the adults how they felt afterwards too. And in between the activities, we did a breathing exercise with a hot air balloon. Hey kids in the canopy of wonder, if you were at creation camp, can you see the screen? We're gonna do our hot air balloon breathing exercise. I think these adults might need your help, okay? You can stay there, but we're gonna do this together. Don't worry, it's only one minute long. So when the balloon goes up, you breathe in. And when the balloon goes down, you breathe out. When I was an undergraduate student at Fresno Pacific University, I chose the conflict and peacemaking focus series. With the elimination of the peacemaking and conflict studies graduate academic programs and their faculty, it's unclear what will become of the remaining associated programs. For those of you who are not familiar with a focus series, it's kind of like a mini minor at FPU. Everyone had to choose a focus series. From Dalton Reimer, Will Friesen, and Larry Dunn, I learned the radical truth that peace is not merely the absence of conflict, as I had always thought. But the first time I heard that, it rang true. As a young adult, I had already had more than enough tension-filled, conflict-laden experiences where I was encouraged, encouraged, to keep my mouth shut in order to not rock the boat and keep the peace. This, of course, was code for maintaining the status quo, 
which invariably values the privileged and powerful at the expense of the vulnerable and disenfranchised. When I learned that peace wasn't merely the absence of conflict, all my life's anger began to make sense. I think our weekly writing group was somewhat surprised a few weeks ago to learn that I'm a person that experiences a lot of anger. But I'm here to tell you that there's nothing like a good therapist and that you can love Jesus and have a therapist too. The solution to much of our mental and emotional distress isn't simply to pray more, like many of us I know have often been encouraged. We tend to label certain emotions bad and other emotions good, but in reality, they, give us, they all give us important information about how we're experiencing the world around us. Anger, for example, gives us important information when something is wrong, when there is injustice. When something happens that isn't right, a fire is stoked in our bellies trying to give us the energy and courage to speak up or act against that injustice. But if we've been trained to think that anger is bad or wrong, what happens to that anger? It might get bottled up and explode at, at some other misplaced moment. It might become shame that turns inward on ourselves and become something more like self-hatred. Why are you like this? What's wrong with you? Might become the tape that we play over and over in our minds. And what happens when someone tells us to just calm down or chill out? Anybody have a match and a can of gasoline? Truly. So I've been thinking about this homily on peace for several weeks now, because in preparation for Bob Yoder's message two weeks ago, our Lexio Divina group read and prayed with Colossians 3. Here it is. Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, be tolerant with each other, and if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. Over all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called in one body, and be thankful, people. Put on was something that came up in our Lexio Divina conversations. And we talked about the ways that wearing a uniform or dressing up makes us behave differently. Likewise, it's a decision to put on things like compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. Now, this is what was stirred up within me during that prayer. The things I put on may influence my behavior the way a uniform can, but the peace of Christ must come from within. This text says the peace of Christ must control your hearts, but how? During that same focus series at FPU, I remember reading stories about people who were deeply committed to nonviolence. They made decisions ahead of time about living this way so that in the moment of crisis, they weren't making the decision about how to respond. They were living out the decision they'd already made, just like Jan with Derek the bully. And so what is this peace? In the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, it's shalom. It's health and wholeness and well-being. It reminds me of flourish. So the desire that all people and all creation might flourish is akin to this peace of Christ. And acting toward that goal is how I allow the peace of Christ to flow through me. The peace of Christ then becomes something like a referee or an umpire keeping watch making sure that I'm living in such a way that all might flourish. Now, when we come to a passage like our gospel reading, I hear it in a different way. 
Jesus isn't just saying he's giving the disciples, or me, a peaceful, easy feeling. Rather, this gift of peace is the ability to desire shalom for all, just as flourishing is God's desire for all creation. It also makes sense of the reading from the letter to the Ephesians that Christ himself is this peace. That is, Jesus' life, ministry, death, resurrection, all most fully embodies and displays God's desire for the flourishing of all. All walls and barriers, everything that keeps us separate from each other, everything that keeps us talking about us and them is broken down when we live in a way that is conducive for the flourishing of all. Our English word peace can have quite the range of meanings, as you might be thinking. If we take a little tour, even just through the songs about peace in our hymnal, we see some general songs about peace. We see songs about peace and justice, songs about war and conflict, and songs about inner peace. Now, generally speaking, our faith tradition would tend to emphasize the importance of peace in the areas of conflict, war, and justice and de-emphasize inner peace as kind of overly sentimental, fluffy stuff. But I would like to really encourage us to give some energy to our own inner peace as well. Not at the expense of doing peace and justice work, but in order to be people from whom peace flows, touching all around us, impacting all that we do. In his book, Being Peace, Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh says, if we are peaceful, if we are happy, we can blossom like a flower and everyone in our family, our entire society will benefit from our peace. Similarly, in Luke 6, Jesus says, the good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So today I invite you to consider this. What is it that referees your thoughts, emotions, and actions? Who keeps the rules? What is it that comes spilling out from your heart in your words and actions? I'm the first one to admit it isn't often the peace of Christ. But if I want to work for a world where there is shalom for all, where all can flourish, there's inner work that I need to do as well. So let's do the hot air balloon breathing exercise one more time. I just saw all those little heads perk up. <laughs> Allowing the peace of Christ to fill us so that God's peace and shalom can be what spills out of our hearts. Amen.